Welcome back, strategists. And for this week's video, we're going to be finishing up the ancestries for Pathfinder 2. And in this video, it's going to be slightly longer than normal. We're going to cover humans, half elves, and half orcs. Because Pathfinder 2 decided that half elves and half orcs should kind of, not really, but maybe yes, be set up as a sub ancestry to humans due to their interbred status, which I feel is a bit of a uh, cheapening, a reducing of the culture behind half-elves and half-orcs, but that's what we have to deal with going forward. Uh, as some of you may have noticed on the Twitter, on Twitter, that I've already recorded this video kind of. <laughs> And I got all the way through it and it turned out OBS didn't have the audio setting on. So I now have a 45 minute video of me gesticulating wildly. I may or may not put that up as a funny, I don't know, maybe just a little five minute clip of it for anyone who just wants to see me losing my mind for no reason. But we're going to move ahead. Humans, being humans, the masters of generalization, have eight hit points between the other races, higher points of... 10 lower points of 6, they are a medium size, and they have the 25 foot movement speed. They have two free ability boosts, and of course, if you do have the alternate rules where you get to take two free ability flaws for one extra ability boost, humans are the only ones to not overlap themselves, so they get the biggest gain out of such a situation. They have the traits of humanoid and human, which while required, I do find kind of humorous because of course anything is humanoid and they specify that humans are the humans of the humanoid, which I find kind of funny. Before we continue ahead, I would like to draw your attention to this side rule. Humans, or I should say half elves and half orcs by default in the rules right now are descended from humans. However, they could in fact, uh, on your GM's uh, approval, be descended from other races. As it stands right now, the big thing to half-elves and half-orcs is that they can draw from human ancestries uh, for their feats, they can draw from their home parent, i.e. orcs or elves, and they can draw from this special list pertaining specifically to the half-elf or half-orc choices. What this means is you could be a dwarf if your GM allows it, a Dwarven Half-Elf, and in that case, you would draw from Elven Dwarven and the Half-Elven list. While this is very good, and I do agree with this, this makes perfect sense, what they've done in terms of book space, though, is everyone else got four heritages to choose from. Humans basically have two, because two of the heritages are now attributed to Half-Elves and Half-Orcs, but these are heritages that any race could choose, assuming you get approval from your GM. So, rather like how I complained about gnomes losing out on some of their choices, humans don't get any extra choices like everyone else. They don't get the full four. They only get two. If you want to argue that humans, in fact, are getting four, then you could make the same argument that every other race is, in fact, getting six. So that's slightly annoying. Also, while half-orcs and half-elves are listed as being breedable from two half-elves and half-orcs, i.e. they're a true breeding race, they themselves do not have a list of four ancestries. They don't have a list of four heritages. So whereas a halfling or a dwarf could be a forge dwarf or a deep dwarf, half-elf is just half-elf. You are defined by what you are bred between. You yourself don't have a heritage to distinguish yourself from. I believe in a future book, this will be uh, written in where they will have choices. And I believe at some point in the writing of this book, they did have a choice. And I have evidence to back that up. But right now, they don't. Human heritages, your four human heritages you can choose from is you're either a human who is descended partially from an elf. You're either you're a human who is descended partially from an orc. And by the way, it draws and points out that they can choose from orc feats. 
they're not really, you know, effectively listed here. So that's a bit of a bummer. Your other two choices are you can be the type of human that got the bonus of skills, or you can be the type of bonus that got a bonus general feat. To point out, you get one, and it's a general feat. Later on, there are some human choices that get you more general feats, but this heritage right here just kind of lets you choose whatever you want if you meet the prerequisites and at any point during character creation. Now, I'd like to point this out. Depending upon where your character creation is, you might get multiple choices out of this. You, the player, you, the GM, need to figure out what the definition of character creation is. For a level one character, of course, this just makes sense. Let them take the feat at the end. At that point, they've met all the prerequisites. But if you're creating a character later on, this does have a slightly different definition than a later human feat does. So read as intended, I think they mean only at first level. But it's not quite written out here unless you take the feats as a prerequisite in and of themselves, the feat level, which does make sense, I admit. But if you're allowing them to write a level five character, all of those could be character creation. Like I said, you might want to work out with your GM or players what qualifies as character creation for the purpose of this feat. Uh, for of this heritage. There are feats later that do the same thing with slightly more specification, and that's why I feel like it's slightly up in the air. At first level, humans get adapted cantrips. This is by itself okay. What this does is you can choose a cantrip from a magical tradition other than your own. So if you're an arcane like wizard, you could choose a cantrip from divine list or the primal list, and that's pretty okay particularly because cantrips being cantrips tend to be of a utility purpose and they tend to get slightly more powerful as you level up. And this is the setup to in such a way as to be a cantrip. You can swap or retrain the cantrip later and you can choose to switch it to a completely different thing. So if you were an arcane person going off the example I have and you chose a divine cantrip, later on you could retrain it to a primal cantrip. That's pretty okay. That's as good as the cantrip is. That's really what that comes down to. Is there a cantrip outside of the tradition you're doing that's really powerful? However the strength of those cantrips are, that is the strength of the cantrip that you'll be dealing with. Moving on, we have cooperative nature, which allows you to get a plus four circumstance bonus to checks on aid or on your checks to aid other people do a thing. This is good. This is good and it... The real thing is this is a core foundational feat for later feats down the line, in which case it becomes a required feat. If you are the type of person who wants to help out your fellow players, or as a GM, I would suggest at some point you have a bunch of people take this, this helps you with some of your NPCs that you set up that you don't know what you want them to be doing at certain points in combat. If you have a NPC that has a slightly niche build, throw this in there if they're human this helps them fulfill other things in particular what really sells is a half elf but it's definitely a you should probably take if you feel like you know being a team player even if you're just a human or even a half orc general training says you can gain a first level general feat you must meet the feats prerequisites but if you select this during character creation you can select that feat later in the process this is why I was pointing out how the heritage is slightly weird. This one specifically says it's the same thing. General feat, uh, general feat. This one specifies, however, it must be a first level general feat. Whereas this heritage doesn't actually specify that. I would assume Rita's intended it being a heritage that it would have to be a first level feat, but it's not written as one. For this, you would have to choose a first level general feat, and again, you would have to choose later on in the at the end of character creation. Whereas, possibly depending upon how you want to word character creation, if you let your players write a higher level character, possibly allow them a higher level feat. I don't think that's intended though. But there is a weird slight gray area where that might come into play. 
Haughty Obstinacy is basically two feats in one, and for that, yeah, I have to recommend it as possibly a feat to be aware of. If you roll a success on saving throws against mental effects that directly control your actions, you critically succeed instead. That by itself is already evasion versus admittedly a niche effect. You get evasion versus things that tend to directly control your actions. Already by itself, that's one feat. Pretty useful. If a creature rolls a failure on a check to coerce you using intimidation, they get a crit failure instead, so they don't get to try again for another week. That effect by itself would also, I would say, generally be a feat by itself. I think because both of these are slightly niche, it's not mental effects. It's mental effects that directly control your actions, and this is only applicable to intimidation effects. I think because they were both niche effects that they crammed them together in one feat, so the sum of the parts being over one one foot, <laughs> one feet, I, I would say that this isn't a bad choice, particularly if you know that you're in a type of situation where either the GM, if you're a player, or the player, if you're a GM, has an effect that would directly control you, i.e. they do a lot of intimidation, or you feel like you're probably going to be dealing against someone who does domination and the like. This is a level one feat, so it's a bit early possibly to be taking that feat because that early on you're not likely to get, I don't think, too many dominate effects. But it is a feat that if you're needing to fulfill a thing to be aware of, like what should I take and maybe at 13th or 17th level you've taken all the feats you want, don't forget to come back to Haughty Obstinacy. It's a pretty decent feat. Natural Ambition allows you to choose a first level class feat for your class. And if you do this during character creation, you can wait till the end to make sure you meet all the prerequisites. It's basically the same thing as general trading, but now this is a class feat. Both of these are really good feats, albeit slightly watered down because you can only choose a first level feat. But if you want to specialize in your class more or be more of a generalist and taking general feats, these are both good feats. Nothing really bad to be talking of here. Natural skill allows you to be trained proficiency in two ranks of your choice. This is the same thing that all the other races got, whereas generally there was a bit of a layover or a crossover in the other races where it chose to for you, and if there was an overlap between the uh, race and your class, you could choose one and said you could get a third one out of it. Humans, you can't really get that third one, but you do get the variability in being able to choose both of your skills. Nothing too good, nothing too bad. Unconventional weaponry, it's a weaponry feat that we've seen up to this point, except for you can just choose any ancestry. That's, again, the humans, masters of being generalists. Not too good, not too bad for going a weapon thing. Keep in mind, humans would allow you to choose other races' weapons. Of the entire list of first level ones, the, the two, or the one basically, that I would suggest, hey, maybe recommend taking this above all else, Cooperative nature. Like I said, it's a bit of a, I'm pointing out what it's going to do in the future, but the ability by itself to just get a plus four on your checks to aid someone else, that plus four is a 5, 10, 15, 20% increase in your chance to succeed at it. And I'm going to sell you on that feat later if you don't think that that's good enough on its own. Adaptive Adept, unfortunately, I would have to recommend against. I get what they're trying to do. It's just the way they've done it. I don't kind of, I really don't back up. What it is, is, is it's an expansion to Adapted Cantrip, where now you can choose a cantrip or a first level spell from the same tradition as your cantrip was from Adapted Cantrip. First of all, quick question that maybe you want to mull over in your head. If you later retrain Adapted Cantrip, do you have to retrain that first level spell? Because you haven't lost the prerequisite. The, this prerequisite is when you choose it, it has to be the same tradition as cantrip. That would slightly possibly change which one, uh, you know, how powerful I would say this is. Going off the assumption, though, that no, Adapted Adept would need to match the same tradition chosen by Adapted Cantrip, I'm going to have to recommend that this isn't that powerful. 
You gain a spell, adding it to your spell repertoire, spell book, and prepared spells, just like the cantrip. You cast the spell as a spell of your class's tradition, so it would be cast as arcane, going off of our wizard example. If you choose a first level spell, however, you do not gain access to heightened versions of that spell, meaning you cannot prepare them if you prepare spells, you can't learn them, or select a spell as a signature spell if you have a spell repertoire. So, spells you can kind of learn as higher level spells, or using signature spells, find a way to naturally heighten it to other things. There is a difference between a first level magic missile and a third level magic missile. This feat only gives you access to the first level spell as a first level spell. You do not gain access to the tradition's normal ability of having the higher level versions of that spell. And that's why I have to recommend against this. A lot of the spells in this game have been set up in such a way that they all naturally get stronger as you, the spellcaster, get stronger. At this point, for that first level spell, you sunk two feats into it, and you do not gain the ability for it to get stronger as you get stronger. So, there's a slight issue with that there. Because at this point, it has to be a real good first level spell, and quite frankly, whatever that tradition is, unless it's a really OP first level spell... I can't suggest taking this. If you're arcane going for divine, you should probably just have someone who's divine learn that spell in a stronger one thereafter. If you're a DM, this still doesn't make sense. Just, just have someone that does that tradition. This is two feats you're sinking in, which you could be making better choices with. I cannot recommend adapted, Adaptive Adept, though Adapted Cantrip, because cantrips naturally get stronger, would be kind of good. If, however, this doesn't have to match your tradition after if you retrain this one, possibly that could be good in that it gives you a cantrip. So between the two of these, you possibly, if you are the type of GM or you have a GM that allows you to retrain this out of step, you could have a cantrip from two different traditions in that interpretation of this. In which case, I could possibly see this being useful because the cantrip does get stronger. It only says the first level spell doesn't. Two feats for two different cantrips from possibly two different traditions. I could see as being a useful choice, but not that first level choice. Clever Improviser, you gained Untrained Improvisation General Feat. That by itself, you're gaining a feat to gain a feat. Pretty good. In addition, you can attempt un you can attempt skill actions that normally require you to be trained, even if you are untrained. That really sells this. This is a good feat. It's it's not the greatest unless you're trying to go for skills. But compared to adaptive adept, if you're not a magic user, I don't see the reason why not. To point out, besides the fact that trained allows you to use your full class level or full character level uh, as the base modifier. For the skill, there are certain things that are like, you cannot use this skill for that type of action unless you are trained, regardless of what type of bonus you have. This allows you to match trained abilities in all skills. So it doesn't matter what the skill is, if you're not trained at it, you can do all of its actions as if you were trained, which is pretty useful. Uh, cooperative soul. This is the upgrade of cooperative nature, and this is how I'm going to sell you on cooperative nature as a feat that I would recommend a lot of people take, especially if you want to be a team player. If you're at least an expert in the skill you are aiding, so whatever your type of skills are that you're normally going to be leading the way on anyways, you get a success on any outcome roll to aid other than a critical success, which means critical failures and failures are successes, successes are successes, and critical successes are critical successes. You cannot fail to aid someone with one of your defining skills, as long as it is the type of skill that would allow you, of course, to aid, which I think most of them should be. This is such a useful thing because this allows you to drag people who are not really that trained in that skill up to having a chance at passing it. Or if they have a chance of passing it, like greatly increasing their chance of passing it. I like this. Anything that is an automatic, this is, this is them saying automatic. You get an automatic success is what this feat says. Automatic basically means you don't need to roll. If you want the critical success, you can go ahead and roll. But if you want to be pedantic, if you want to be a prick and you don't necessarily need a critical success on your aid another for the other player, you can just say, I've aided him. And then be like, I'm not making that roll. And like, like there's, I automatically aid him. 
like critical. I don't care about the critical success and you can help things go along. And you know what? It is kind of a fun thing as a player to be doing an action that normally requires a roll and just being able to like roll it and ignore the roll. Be like, yeah, whatever. I pass. That's always a fun thing to do. And if you're helping someone else make their roll, that's good. As a GM, this reduces the amount of rolls that's going on in the table. One player is aiding another. He really doesn't need to make the roll. The other player gets the bonus. He now feels confident in doing his roll. You're not adding to the rolls. You're taking away from them, and everyone's happier. This is a good feat all around. Even if you're a uh, DM or GM, you could have, again, like I said earlier, you have someone in the back who has a very niche thing you want them to do in combat. The other actions, you could have them aiding people, even if it doesn't make sense, just because. Incredible Improvisation is an upgraded clever improviser. As a free action, once per day, you gain a plus four circumstance bonus to a skill check that you are not trained in. It's pretty good. It's not the greatest, but it's pretty good. Again, 20% greater chance of succeeding at this. You get to pull off anything that was trained anyways. Uh, and the only real weird thing to point out, though, it's not even a bad against the feet. It's just so that you are remembering this is better for feats you're not trained in. If you become trained at a skill at all, immediately you cannot do incredible improvisation at it. So the less skills you're trained in, the more likely incredible improvisation is to help you. I'm not saying do a build around purposely having less skills because being naturally trained would be better, but the, the less skills you're trained in, the better incredible improvisation becomes for you, which is really useful. Multi-talented allows you to take another multi-class feat even before you should be allowed to take another multi-class feat. What sells it, though, is if you're a half-elf, you don't even need to meet the ability score prerequisites. So as we went over in ability scores, normal breakdown's going to be like 18, 16, 14, 12, what was it, 10, 8 or something like that? So if you're multi-class and you're likely going to do an 18 and your second class is going to be, if you're trying to multi-class a bunch of times, you're going to probably choose a, a class that's based upon your 16. At that point, you're needing to meet ability score prerequisites. So what, you have maybe like the 14, the 12 to choose from? Like your options are limited for this second uh, multi-class option. But with this, you could choose from your weakest thing. This adds in a lot of ability to role play. Though, let's be frank, if you're multi-classing into a class that's core ability score is something that you're very weak at, maybe you're not going to be doing good at it. It's better for role-playing than necessarily your roles, but it does give you that option. I do like this. It's a, it's a really good selling point for half-elves. Otherwise, you're really needing to go for a build that's wide and not tall anyways. Nah, nah. To each their own. I don't have anything bad against that one. 13th level, it's the final upgrade to the weapons for the humans. And that's the only real choice you have at 13th level if you're a human. So between 13th and again, you get another feat at 17th. Somewhere in there, you should be able to cram in some of this, some of this cooperation stuff. You have some extra feat slots. Now we're going to go into the halvesies. Now, like I said before, some of these I'm going to need to specify, but half elf and half orc, as long as your GM signs off on it, can apply to other races. You can be a half elven dwarf, you can be a half elven uh, halfling, you can be a half elven gnome. So these don't all apply to the standard build. That's more important for orc. And half elf has some goofy things, which I believe proves half elves earlier on in their design were a true breeding race on their own with different heritages. Elven atavism. You gain the benefits of an elven heritage of your elven parents or ancestors. You typically cannot select a heritage that depends or improves on an elven feature you don't have. For example, you cannot gain the cavern elf's dark vision ability if you do not have low light vision. In these cases, at the GM's discretion, you might gain a different benefit. That's a pretty weird example for them to go for. Considering half elves didn't get to choose a heritage normally. They have to have low light vision. That's what a half elf is. Even if you were on a dwarven half elf, you would still get low light vision. You would get that no matter what. You don't have a choice in this. But this thing here seems to be implying that you did at some point. 
So I suspect in a future book, they're going to release heritages for half elves and probably half orcs. And also just the heritage for orcs because there's no orc listed. So what are they drawing from for their orcish feats? At least not as a full list, list down like this is. That being said, this is, this is, if you're doing half elf, this is pretty good. Get those elven, get, choose an elven heritage. Why not? This gives you a full and proper heritage because at this point, going off of humans as default, but this could be any race, you could be a human who got the half elf for all those bonuses and your first level feat, you chose to also gain an elven heritage. So you're a human gaining an elven heritage, but you still get to choose those human generalization feats. If you swing things around together, this allows you to get all those elven skill retrainings and the human uh, guaranteed to assist people, aid in others. If you can cram those together, oh my gosh, you're helping everyone with like the most crucial skills they need that day. Just re just do the elven thing where you learn the skill you know you're going to be needing to do that day. Be really good at that skill and then help everyone else with it guaranteed. Boom. You are the world's best team player if you do this. Would like to point out though, if you do take this, you can only take this at first level and you are not allowed to retrain into or out of this feat, which makes sense. You're not retraining a heritage. But as a sl slight complaint about the lore, the half elves need to take a feat to be able to now have a heritage and their heritage is just, you get to draw from an elven heritage. So you're basically a human character with a heritage of, you're actually a half elf with a heritage of, but you were raised by elves. Which elf were you raised by? A half elf does not in and of itself have a heritage. All you're defined by is you're basically a mutt and what race raised you, which is kind of a bummer. And I feel like it, they need to release it in one of their earlier books, uh, the expansion on the half elves. At fifth level, inspire imitation to sell the co-op feat even more. Whenever you critically succeed at a skill check, you automatically qualify. I love automatic. You automatically qualify to use the aid reaction when attempting to help an ally use the same skill, even without spinning an action to prepare to do so. Mix those with the other two feats. What this means is one, first of all, I'm really good at this skill. We're going to assume I'm at least expert. Boom. I critically succeed at this skill. Let's say it's done. It's a skill I like doing. We're going to critically succeed at it. I immediately get to say, hey, you, boom, I'm immediately helping you do the same skill. And I don't have to waste any action economy to do so. You get a bonus. If I want to make the roll, I get a plus four because of that first one. I get a plus four to do it to help me get a critical success. But if I don't, I still succeeded at helping you anyways. Like, this is a really nice combo of being the world's best team player. And admittedly, you basically be giving up a lot of your racial feats if you mix this with the elven one for those two retraining ones. That's your five racial feats. I think maybe you get one more, but you become the best at doing skills. You become the best skill monkey and you make everyone else also somehow really good at skill monkey. It, it's the feat list that keeps on giving and it just, it has so much combo potential. I just, I love all those feats together. Supernatural charm. You can cast first level charm as an arcane and innate spell once per day. It doesn't take away from your spell list. So it is slightly better than that thing we saw before. So that's kind of good, but you only get to choose charm. So, eh? If you really want charm, that's good. But like I said, you don't have many slots at this point to do so. I would suggest Inspired Imitation. That's just really good. Now we get to Half Orcs. And this is going to take a second because, man, do like if, if I were to, if you were to ask me right now, come up off the street, hey, what race or what heritage would you say is the worst heritage because of all its choices? What should I probably not choose? I hate to break it to you. Other than lore reasons, I cannot suggest Half Orc. There are a lot of these where a lot of people like these rules. Full disclosure, a lot of the rules I'm about to comment on work similarly in previous versions of the game, and I didn't like them there either. They've just slightly been made worse by the way the mechanics work in this game. So let's, d let's dive into them. First of all, and I'm going to try to keep this rant as small as possible, Monstrous Peacemaker. Long story short, 
You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to diplomacy checks against non-humanoid intelligent creatures, as well as sense motive checks. But you also, only plus one, 5% greater chance. You also get this versus humanoids that are marginalized in human society. And this line right here, I don't think they play tested that at all. I get why they did it. They're, it's 2019. They, 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 they have parts of the character sheet where they, they, they even like, what are your pronouns and stuff like that. I get why they wanted to put something in like that. I, I'm not hating on that. I don't think they play tested this well, though. If they did, they would have given it a bigger bonus because otherwise this is too much work on a DM for too little a bonus. There's two ways to do this if you're a DM. BT, by the way, if you're a player, ask your DM how he's going to do this. And as a DM, there's two ways for you to do this. One, don't allow this feat. Or two, make that scale. Like plus one for every four character levels, minimum one for this to make sense because otherwise this feat is utterly pointless by the end of the game. And it's a lot of paperwork for no reason. This is my issue. Why? Because I know I'm already probably gonna get some flack on this for hating on something that mentioned marginalization, but hear me out. One, just the base thing. Your half orc could have been a half orc that wasn't human. You could have been a half orc that was raised in dwarven civilization, for instance. So at this point, it's not human society. It should be dwarven. Let's just address that right now. It shouldn't say human society. It should say the non-orc gener, like the non-orc half of you society, whatever you were grown from. Because two, if you want to specify this as human society, in Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons, way more than in real life, societies are way smaller, and societies of drastically different mindsets can share a border as is routine. I'm going to use for 3.5 here, 3.5 fourth edition real quick. I'm going to use Eberron as my example, which I know is a Pathfinder. Just bear with me here so I can point out how some of this works. In Eberron, they're one of the kingdoms, one of the different areas. They're all necromancers. Like that's the thing. They won the war because they raised their own people as undead and they raised their enemy as undead. All of their living soldiers are like the officers and NCOs. All the grunt work is undead. There's an entire civilization that is powered by the undead. Right next to it, like sharing the western border, is a city that's heavy into spies and heavy into elves and they... Like, like they're all about the wind magic and shit. And it's basically, uh, while there is a royalty, it's kind of heavily implied that the royalty is like severely enmeshed with this guild that does airships. So everything is like, like half elves and elves, like snotty, snotty people that we are holier than now because we have the magic. We have this blood mark. You don't, you are a lesser citizen. In that case, and again, I realize that that doesn't exist in any of the Pathfinder realms, just bear with me. In this case, what society do you get the bonus from? In the Necromancer one, they mentioned giants. I would assume that they actually tend to like giants, especially in a Pathfinder situation. If you have a Necromancer kingdom or a society going on, giants tend to be semi, like not mindless, but... They kill people who in, who get in their, ter their their territory and stuff. Depending upon the giant, they could be intelligent storm giants or could they just be hill giants. They just chuck rocks and grr smash. They might kill people. So the necromancer might then be able to get fresh sources of things to raise. So that society might actually be unnecessarily nice to giants. Because one, they don't want to kill them because the giants just doing their natural gianty territorial thing are far more active than an undead giant would be. The giant could kill people for them and the giant could bring it back. It's like it's like a way of generating material without having to do much because the giant feeds itself. Yet you pay him money, but the giant regenerates, the giant feeds himself. A necromancer could love giants. Next door, you can have a society of elves where practically everyone else, everyone is marginalized. So in this case, 
do you get the bonus from the guy who got raised? Let's say we're going with giants here. If you were talking to a giant who was raised in the left society, the elven one who's snooty, they would be marginalized. Do you get a bonus against him when he's in that society, but not when he moves over? Like, do you get a bonus in the current society? That wouldn't make sense, I admit. You would get the bonus based on what they grew up in. But now, as a GM, you have to start calculating what society everyone grew up in. You get what I'm saying? Like, you have to all of a sudden, you add an entire layer of calculation for any major NPC because they're doing diplomacy checks versus them. You have to start doing major calculations just to figure out who was or was not marginalized, which is fine, but you only get a plus one bonus? The player's not going to care about this bonus in four levels tops, and it's only a circumstance bonus. If you make it so it scales, like every four levels, so by level four, or it's plus one all the way up to level eight, I admit, so that's kind of a bit of a bummer, but at level eight, it's a plus two. At level 12, it's a three. At level 16, it's a four, and at level 20, it's a five. It's still something. It makes sense for the lore you're going with, but plus one is, hard, is hardly a bonus. They didn't want to make it higher because it's a level one feat. This should be a scaling feat that should have been introduced at a later level is what this should have been. But it kind of wouldn't have made sense to suddenly become a peacemaker. And it also doesn't make sense the fact that I could take this feat at a later level. But this feat is too little bonus for what the GM has to do. If you're the GM and you're fine, like I said, you want to do this, that's fine. But for the love of God, for your own sanity, give them a bigger bonus. Make it scale with their level or something. Because if you're going to have to start doing these calculations, you're going to want the player to get something out of this. You get what I'm saying? Because if, if you're doing the calculations and your player's forgotten he's gotten this bonus, th that's the worst thing. To put more work on the DM and it's for something that's so minor, the player's going to forget they have it. That, like I said, you can take it one of two ways. Strip the rule entirely. Just don't even deal with that headache. And I would suggest that for newer DMs, I would. Or if you're fine with this, and because and, and it, it does, it flushes out the world. It makes you think about the racial relationships. I like the idea. Give them more than a plus one. That is such a tiny bonus. Because you know when this is going to really start coming in handy? At the higher levels. At low levels, they're not doing too many diplomacy checks, are they? They're fighting rats or some nonsense. They're fighting CR1 quarters. They're not caring about the plus one to a sense motive check versus the freaking orc. That's not helping anybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, no. And then again, back to the first thing. It kind of depends on what society it is, isn't it? What the, what the other person is. There's different societies. Different races have different, whatever. Going on. I try to keep that as small as I can. Orc ferocity. Now, this is the one that I really don't like. This entire chain of feats, I feel like, is going to get you killed because of the rules they changed. I did not like the orcish flaw of ferocity or any of those variants in any other game. I didn't like it in Pathfinder. I didn't like it in 3.5. I didn't like it in 3.0. I didn't like it. Anytime this type of thing comes up, I do not like this. I want to make clear on this. Full disclosure. I do, however, find that it's particularly egregious in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So what it is, is once per day as a reaction. So by the way, it kind of needs your reaction. They didn't list it as a free action, which I find weird. So if you've done an attack of opportunity, this doesn't work. If you are reduced to zero hit points, but not killed, you stay at one hit point and your wounded increases by one. In Pathfinder 2e, when you're brought to zero, you go unconscious and you are dying. You become dying one. If you succeed at your save, you stabilize. If you don't, you become dying two. Succeed, stabilize, fail, dying three, fail again, dying four. At dying four, you are dead. Give me your character sheet, shred it. You're dead. You need to get resurrected. If you stabilize at dying one, for instance, dying one goes away and you get a thing called wounded one. And unless wounded is treated, if you die again, wounded gets added to dying and it becomes your grand total dying stat. So if I go unconscious again and I get dying one, but I already had wounded one, I'm really at dying two. And this very short timer is what I think is why, is why I really don't like this. So if I'm a DM and I hit you and you have this or you don't have this, you go unconscious. I use this as my cue to go to another person in, in the group. Because I'm not necessarily trying to purposely kill you. 
I, I don't put me in that position. I try to make it fun for everyone. If however you stand up, and this is my reason why I don't like this for any version of this thing. If you're still standing, you're in my way. I have to hit you. Now you're just that much closer to dying. I might accidentally kill you when I should not have accidentally killed you. Like as a player, you think you're getting something out of this. You're not, you're reducing your chances. So what happens here is normally you become dying one, right? But you're unconscious and I don't hit you anymore. But what happens is now you get wounded one and then I just hit you again and you get dying one, which means really you're dying two. You, you like, you lost out on everything. You made me blow an extra attack hitting you and that's true, but this reduces your chances. How many checks you get? I think it's like a flat 15, DC 15 flat check to stabilize if someone's not helping you. It's like a 30% chance to stabilize. If you have all three of the checks, you have something like a 75% chance because the 30% chance to succeed and in 30% of the 70% that you failed, so another 21%, so you're already over 50 after just two checks. This has lower, and I think after that, you're like 75 or something like that. You go from 75 to 50, and if you don't have that second check, you go all the way down to 30% chance of uh, surviving and not dying. There is a benefit the way they had this written, though. I will. I would like to point this out. If I drop you unconscious by critically hitting you, you start at dying too. Orc Ferocity would negate that and make it just be dying one. Or wounded one. In this case, this would be like the one time, if you're going to get Orc Ferocity, this is how I would use it. I would never use it unless I was killed by a critical hit. In which case... I still keep standing and I'm at wounded one. If he attacks me again and drops me, then I'm at dying two, but I was already going to be at dying two to begin with, if that makes sense. At that point, it is a bonus in your favor. In that point and that point only. There is an upgrade to Orc Ferocity that makes it more annoying, but that one benefit right there is one to be aware of. Just as a rule though, I do not like this mechanic in any game that implements this. Orc Sight, if you have low light vision, you upgrade it to dark vision, but you can only get this at first level and you cannot retrain into or out of it. Fine. I think this is basically taking from an orc heritage because it's like how the elves did it. It's basically a heritage is what they've done. They've added it as a feat though because the orcs don't have their own heritages right now. Orc Superstition as a reaction. Note, it is a reaction not going to gel well with Orc Ferocity. If you blow Orc Superstition to try to get a bonus and it kills you, you won't then be able to do Orc Ferocity. You can do one or the other. You cannot do both in the same turn. You get a plus one bonus on a saving throw against a triggering spell or magical effect, which is something that allows you to do a saving throw. So basically, as long as you have a reaction or your class that doesn't really use reactions, you can use this to get a plus one bonus essentially once around versus spells or effects. That's pretty good. That is pretty good, and slight spoiler, it does update, it does upgrade to one that is a permanent plus one circumstance bonus. It is only a circumstance bonus, but it, it's okay. Plus one of saves is plus one to saves. Orc weapon familiarity is a familiarity feat. That's just for orcish weapons. We're used to this. Weapon carnage is the upgrade to that. Same as every other race. Victorious vigor. You bring a foe to zero hit points. Again, this is a reaction. A lot of orc things are reactions. You gain temporary hit points equal to your con mod until the end of your turn if you bring a foe to zero hit points. So this is good and bad. One, your ability scores are reduced in Pathfinder 2e. You don't tend to be able to get them anywhere near as high as you used to be able to in the, the games that led up to Pathfinder 2e. So this is a lit... A little less useful than it might have been in one of those type of games. You're looking at at max level one or level five, like a four or five temp per round. In which case, because of that, it's kind of low, not necessarily that good. If, however, you are the type of class that can regularly, and I mean like turn after turn, guarantee a kill, and you're not using your reactions, getting five hit points per turn, especially if you're getting hit, is like getting a free five or four hit point heal every turn. So you need to be the type of build that's purposely killing massive amounts of scrubs. This is not a good feat versus the leader, but this is a really good feat versus like a horde of little tiny rats or something, if that makes sense. 
not like an actual swarm. I mean, like a bunch of little ones, so things where you can constantly say I've dropped someone in that case, really good. Get a lot of health out of it. But one to one, this is not good for that type of build. This is not good for a one on one fighter. Persuasive superstition is the upgrade to orc superstition, which is just you get the plus one bonus at all times. It's, it's good. Like, it is good. I did like it as orc superstition, but now you're two feet in. Two feet for a one. The big benefit you're really getting out of this is you free up the reactions, and you can do it more than once per round. So if you were someone who didn't use reactions, and you don't think you're getting hit more than once a round by a thing that you can do a save on, this really doesn't help you, does it? It's a feat that was possibly already covered by orc superstition. So again, it depends on what type of situation you find yourself in. Are you going to be getting hit by more than one spell around? Or do you like to use your reactions for something else? Then pervasive may be useful. If you're not one of those two situations, there's no reason to upgrade from orc superstition. It already does it for you. 13th level, incredible ferocity, which makes orc ferocity just that much more stupid. Uh, instead of doing it once per day... You can now do it once per hour. Again. I tried to drop you. You didn't. So I hit you again. So now you're at negative two. Let's say you stabilize immediately. Let us say you stabilize immediately. Little over an hour later, I hit you. Somehow you're healed, but you still have the wounded status. I hit you, drop you to zero. You're supposed to be at negative three. This is really a good point for me to be like, hey, I should stop hitting you but you decide to activate this anyways. So you stand up, I hit you. Oh, look at that. You immediately go to dying four and I've killed you. And you didn't give me the DM really much of a chance to not have you kill me. So kind of a bit of a bummer. Yes, you could say, ah, but in that situation, I wouldn't activate it since I have to choose. It's a reaction. I have to choose to use it. If that's what we're going with in that situation, why did you take this feat? Because in this situation, you've had to have blown it the first time, or you didn't use it the first time. And now you're using it the second time, in which case you didn't need ferocity. Ferocity is only good if somehow you need to use it twice in one day. And if you're not using it for that second time, is it really helping you that much? No, the, the Goldilocks zone of using this is when you're somehow able to get dropped down to zero and then are able to, within that day, get treated enough to no longer have any wounded stat and then get dropped again. That is your golden zone, is that twice in one day, you could reduce the effect of a critical hit. Two feats, you've gone two feats in for the extremely niche opportunity that's in your favor, where twice in one day, you got dropped with a critical hit, you negated it, so you got one extra round of becoming the meat bag, and also somewhere in the middle, you had a healer that removed your wounded stat. That's the only extremely niche situation where both of these feats together are in your favor. Otherwise, they're going to lead to your characters dying, like D-E-D -E -D dead, dying. And it's not going to be your DM's fault. Your DM might actually get slightly annoyed, especially if he's in the middle of like a good part of the story. And he's like, okay, they're about to finally catch the big bad. Things are happening. And then you die and the DM didn't know it was coming because you had ferocity going. Because the other way for the DM to rock this is you say, oh, I've used my ferocity. The DM go, oh, what are you at wounded? You go, I'm wounded three. And the DM go, randomly, the bad guy decides to ignore you. That's not really natural, is it? So please, please kind of don't take this. Maybe what they should have done if you're going to do incredible ferocity is, uh, or between one of these, is it to have... Uh, have your wounded condition. Like it takes two wounded to add one to dying when you go unconscious, then this would have been better. But wounded and dying only needing to equal up to four means that you ha do not have that long of a timer before this is actually got you killed. And then finally the orcs get to max out their weapon familiarity feat. Opa. Um, the next video we do, we're not going to cover backgrounds. I'm going to skip all the way past those because really all they are is you get a skill feat and you gain two skills. Until I start covering all the feats and skills, it's not going to help us much. 
Maybe I'll come back to this, but we're going to be skipping backgrounds. Just choose the one that looks like it does the best for you. And then next time we will be covering uh, classes. If you found any of this entertaining, click that thumbs up button. If you found this educational and would like to be notified when I do more of them, click that subscribe button. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll catch you guys next time.